And you want me, you're going to, you want me to look at you and not the camera? Yeah. <laughs> My name is Alex Pandolfo. I was born in Manchester in 1954, which makes me 65. If life is a biological thing, where the heart keeps beating, then, you know, that, that's life. But life's far more than that. Life is about who we are, it's about how we are, and it's about how we're able to celebrate that life. When I got my diagnosis in 2015, I was told that I had somewhere between four to five years to live, and that I could live a lot longer than that, maybe up to 11 years, but certainly after that five to six year period, I wouldn't know who I am. I am very familiar with dementia because my father had a condition called multiple systems atrophy, and he had dementia that's related to that. And I saw the torrid time that he had with that condition. I saw how he was tortured by it. For the last month of my dad's life, we, we, we fought constantly to, to keep him at home because that was his wishes and my mum's wishes. And then for the last month of his life, I said to my mum, it's not just social care that dad needs now, there's medical care, so we need to get him at home. But I pledge he will not be by himself. And my mother was by his side from eight o'clock every morning till about 10 o'clock of the night. I'd come in at 10 o'clock of the night and I'd sit with my dad and I'd be there till mum come through. So he was never left by himself. And I'd be sat there, just on a little chair, and he'd be, he'd be sleeping, he wouldn't be able to communicate. And every now and then, he'd go, <gasps> and his breath would go in. Uh, every day? Uh, uh, several times a night. And every time he took that deep breath, I'd be thinking, don't breathe, don't breathe. Yeah, I, I love my father more than I can explain to anybody. <laughs> and I still get upset, thinking about the suffering that he went through. And every time he breathed, it was, oh. Why are we keeping that person alive? And by keeping that person alive, what quality of life are they going to experience? Is it a quality of life that you would like to experience? And when he died, and I realized that there was nothing that could be done to, to make his passage any easier. And I, I said at that time that if anything ever happened to me, I would apply to Life Circle in Baal in Switzerland for an assisted death, which I did. A man with his education can't make the distinction between somebody that's suicidal and somebody that wants a humane assisted death. And that's why I get, well, I was gonna say upset, but I get really angry sometimes when people call it assisted suicide. Suicide is generally something that somebody does when society's let them down. It means that they have some kind of medical problem that hasn't been identified and hasn't been treated and it's a last ditch desperate act that's made in an irrational state and, and that is suicide and i feel for anybody that's driven to that and i don't blame that person for suicide i, I blame us i blame society for that an assisted death is, i don't think i'm committing suicide because i my argument is when i got that diagnosis 
I was, I was given a death sentence. So my death is already taking place. I love life, I enjoy life, and I want to carry on enjoying life for as long as I possibly can. What I don't want to do is face the pain, both physical and psychological, that my condition will bring. So when I go to Switzerland, what I'm, they're accepting that I'm accepting that my death's taking place, it's gonna be horrific and painful, but they can step in and assist the death that's already taking place in a peaceful, humane, controlled environment. And I think that's a very, very important distinction to, to make. What, what people fall back on is there's a clause in that that says, do no harm. Yeah, now, and I agree with that. Do no harm. You shouldn't do harm to people. Yeah. But when is doing harm and doing good? You know, so we've got to talk, so if you do no harm, then you need to do good. That, that, that would be the logical conclusion. If keeping me alive is subjecting me to pain, both psychological and physical, because you can keep me alive, is that doing harm or is it not doing harm? That is the question that we need to pose. So what do we actually mean by do no harm? Now my understanding of do no harm is, is, is taking the patient, taking their condition and taking their wishes into consideration. So like I said about my father, he had the best possible care that was available, but it didn't stop him having illusions. It didn't, he beat me up. My father beat me up. He wouldn't want to have done that. He was screaming out in pain when, when, when there was nothing particularly wrong with him. He was seeing monsters coming at him. Now, doing, is that suffering? Is that doing harm to the person? And if we can put an end to that, is do no harm, actually ensuring that person dies peacefully and the way that they want to die. If you can afford to have a, a humane voluntary assisted death, you can go. But what I think is criminal is if you can't afford that, so that means the, the majority of people in this country who are the most socially and economically deprived do not have the choice that I have. And I think that's wrong. And that's why I campaign vigorously to try and get the law changed. <laughs>